Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today I'm continuing my conversations with uh, Brother Jason Jack. Uh, we're doing a series of videos. Uh, the title of the series is uh, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And that, uh, that playlist is on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, I hope you will go back and watch the series from the beginning. And right now uh, we're about, I think about 25% of the way through all these verses. So I think this is video number six or seven or eight. Okay, before we get started here, uh, Brother Jason Jack, I want to say hi to everybody. All right, then. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you have not already subscribed to uh, uh, Jason Jack's YouTube channel, uh, I, I hope you will subscribe to it. He's doing a, a great job uh, teaching and defending uh, the, the, the true gospel, the, the good news that salvation is offered to everyone as a free gift. Uh, we, we don't have to work for it and earn it through any religious efforts on our part. We just simply receive it uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so uh, please subscribe to his channel if you haven't already done it. Okay, brother, uh, let us uh, let me see. We skipped a verse last time, so let me go back to that. It's uh, number 26 on our list, and it's 1 John. Now, that could be scary in itself, just saying it's 1 John. Let's see, 1 John 5. Verse 13, I'm going to plug that into my Bible Gateway program here. And now I'll pull it up in the parallel. So we'll look at it in the KJV and then also in the Amplified. In the KJV it reads, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, I wasn't, I didn't recognize it from the address of the verse, 1 John 5, 13. Um, I should memorize that address because this is such an important verse. I, I, I quote it or paraphrase it. I cite it all the time, but I just hadn't memorized the address. Uh, all right, brother, as usual, uh, Pressure's on you to, to teach first on it. All right, well, I'll this verse. And this verse is used a lot of time in soul winning as the initial verse that people use, um, you know, because they will um, ask somebody if they, you know, met the Lord today, if they've got a day, would they know that they're going to heaven and go through that? And then the response after after getting some feedback from from that person that you're solving uh, to is well the Bible says that we can know that we have eternal life and and begin with this verse and how do we know it's by believing on the name of the Son of God Jesus Christ and so this is a powerful verse in that aspect and not only uh, eternal life, but eternal security and assurance. And um, you know, I, I just, I just really, um, well, all of First John is, is awesome, but especially First John five. Uh, there's so many great verses like this in there. Um, you know, with First John five seven, uh, speaking of the Trinity. First John five thirteen. This, and then First John five twenty, which is one of my favorite, which discusses. Uh, Jesus Christ as the true God and eternal life um, to close the um, five chapter epistle. So um, this is a great verse. Uh, not a lot more to say about it, but I'm sure um, you have some great comments about it. Well, I, uh, you know, in, in any kind of Bible study, you know, you uh, context, of course, is uh, the thing you have to uh, always consider. And, and we have to ask ourselves a few basic questions, and that, and that is, who wrote this? Uh, well, this is written by the Apostle John, uh, who also wrote uh, 
the fourth gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this is the same apostle. So he wrote uh, uh, these epistles, these little, little letters, like First John and Second John. Is there a third John? Is there a third John? Yeah, I thought that was the third John. Um, and then, uh, so he wrote those three epistles, and he wrote this, the gospel account. Uh, and it, it's interesting, in, in this epistle, and also in the gospel account, um, he's explaining here the point, the, the, the purpose of writing it. In, in the gospel of John, uh, in the last chapter, he, he says that um, he's writing this so that we can uh, know how to get saved by believing on uh, the Son of God. So he says the same thing there. He says the whole purpose of him writing that gospel account is the, the purpose is to teach us how to get saved. Uh, so I always refer people to the Gospel of John, um, uh, not only to get saved, but I say before you read anything else in the Bible, read the Gospel of John at least 10 times over and over again. And if you read it 100 times, it, it's even better. You get so ensconced in, in that that it becomes part of your DNA, and then you test everything else against what you learned in John, and you'll, you'll be doing fine then. And if it doesn't agree with John, then you, then you don't understand it correctly. Uh, and this is the same thing here he's doing in this epistle, First John. And so he's, you're right, this is an eternal security verse, and it's also a uh, uh, blessed assurance verse, uh, in that... Uh, you know, I talked about the diagnostic question. I learned that, oh boy, a few months after I got saved, um, I joined a church and they had a class uh, in evangelism. By, it was titled Evangelism Explosion. And the, the person that organized or taught the course, and actually we just had the book that we used, but uh, the actual writer of the course is D. James Kennedy, who's uh, recently... Uh, deceased, but uh, he, uh, that's my first introduction on how to be an evangelist, how to present the gospel, and it was a very good uh, course, and it got me off on the right track, um, but D. James Kennedy said, we need to diagnose their condition, and the, what you do is you ask them a diagnostic question, and that is, are you certain that you're going to go to heaven, and if so, why? Uh, so this, uh, and a lot of times if you ask someone, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? Or, oh, no one can be certain. You can, no one can know for sure. That's the typical answer you get from people, uh, particularly uh, even a, a, a Calvinist, you, as much as you think that they uh, believe in uh, perseverance of the saints, that they, they believe in eternal security. They, they, they even say that you can't know until you die because you, you, only then will you know if you're one of the elect. Because you have the end hasn't come, you haven't persevered until the end. So, um, and, and then of course the Roman Catholics, they they can't say for certain that they're going to go to heaven. And you ask them, they say, well, I don't know. I hope they got my fingers crossed, hoping I'm good enough. So, uh, this certainty is a very very important thing, and uh, the the Christian term that we love to use to uh, describe uh, the certainty is our blessed assurance. We're happy because we're assured, we're, promised, we're guaranteed we're going to go to heaven. And if a person doesn't have that, then they probably never really understood the gospel, the good news, if they don't have that assurance and that certainty. But this verse here is telling us uh, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. That's the point you were making, that, and that uh, is... Uh, uh, really the certainty that we're talking about here. Uh, God wants us to know and have certainty, know that we're guaranteed, and be able to be rest. And uh, we have, you know, people say, well, you're teaching people to have a license to sin. No, I'm telling you, the Bible says we have a license to rest. We don't have to worry. We can rest in our faith in, that Jesus is promised us and guaranteed us we're going to go to heaven. I can rest in that. And so that's the, this phrase here that you may know that you have eternal life, uh, is really one of the most important phrases we find in the whole Bible. Um, and so he says here again, he says, these things have I written unto you 
So he, he's saying again that the reason he wrote this, just the same way he and the God said of Gospel of John, the reason I wrote this, he wants to know the reason he's even taken the time to write the letter, the reason he took the time to write the Gospel account is to teach us how to get saved and to give us this blessed assurance, uh, this guarantee, so we can rest and have peace and joy. Now, when it says that... Um, uh, you that believe on the name of the Son of God. And then he repeats it at the end there. It says, uh, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, I live the way that's phrased. And uh, to me, it, it tells me uh, an awful lot. But there are people, particularly these uh, Paul Olius and these, uh, these people, even if they're not a Paul Olius, uh, there are people that believe that... Uh, if, if you, you must be saved only by 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, which, which says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried on the third day, rose from the dead according to the scriptures. Um, those points must be acknowledged, recognized, and understood, and, and have faith in, uh, and it must be a, your a faith in that. Uh, and yet, we have no reference here to the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, so I've always argued that I, I'm going to tell everybody about the deity of Christ. I'm going to tell everybody about you know, all his miraculous signs. And, and the greatest sign was his resurrection to, to prove his claims were true. That, And he, he said in the, in the last video we did, we talked about, he said, if you don't believe uh, I am he, then you will die in your sins. Well, I believe that I am he, it means that you believe that he is truly who he claimed to be. Uh, so, um, uh, what, who he claimed to be was uh, the, the Savior uh, and the Son of God. Uh, I think I got a little off track there. but uh, uh, So, the point I'm making is, I want to make sure people know who Jesus is, what he's done for them, his death for their sins, his resurrection, and believing on him. But I also believe that uh, it, uh, there are people who believe in these facts. Uh, for example, if you ask a Roman Catholic, uh, do you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and was raised from the dead? And they say, of course I believe that. Uh, now, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Uh, well, I don't know. I hope I'm going. I, I go to church and I do this. See, they, they do, even though they believe they've got their facts straight, their faith is not in Jesus and what he's done for them. Their faith is still remains in their own ability to, to be righteous. So uh, there is a difference between understanding the facts and having faith in the person and work of Jesus. And so uh, that's why I note here that this says that we will have eternal life. And it simply says by believing on the name. By believing on the name of the Son of God, and his name is Jesus, and his name is in Hebrew is Yeshua, and that literally translates to God saves. So I think all these references to there's a name above all names, no other name over to heaven whereby we must be saved, and uh, you're, you're saved by believing on the name of the Son of God. Why this repeated reference to you're saved by this name? It's because the name means God saves, and you're relying on God to save you. Who is and who is He? Jesus. So, all right, I gave you a lot of information. You probably more than more than we needed. Uh, any, any more on this verse or anything that I just said?
confidently say, I know I have eternal life. Because you know who Jesus is. You know that he died for your sins. You know, you know that he overcame death for you. And you know that his word is good. And, and so the reason it's so important as you mature as a Christian is because if you don't have that assurance, if you don't have confidence, you're not going to go out and tell other people about Jesus because you're too worried about yourself. You're still looking at yourself. Am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I, what am I doing? Am I doing everything right? Am I following this? Am I repented of my sins? You know? When you understand that God's grace and his love and his mercy that's received through faith and how, how much power that has and how that has so much more power in, than the will of the flesh in doing things that are pleasing to God and being profitable to others and helping others and telling others about Jesus Christ. You know, he knows. That's the reason that he wants you to know that you have eternal life. So I think that's why this passage is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you were referencing the, the, the people that, that, that uh, didn't have this assurance. Uh, uh, they were, they are likely to not uh, witness to others because they don't have their own confidence. Or, or they could be the the other side of that coin, just the people that they sure are confident they're going to go to heaven because they are so full of spiritual pride in themselves. Uh, but they want to put everybody else in the microscope just to compare and say, are you, did you shed tears like I did when I got saved? You know? Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's... so there's two kinds of assurance. <laughs> there's assurance in Jesus Christ, and then there's assurance in yourself. And you want to make sure that you have assurance in the right thing. So there's a lot of self-righteousness in religion, and uh, especially in... The higher you go in religious leadership of whatever church or denomination or um, or faith it is, you know, those tend to um, be the ones that are, are most self-righteous and think they're doing all the right things and they're living um, the perfect life and they're turning the focus back on themselves and they start trusting in themselves. Mm-hmm. And if they've never trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, then they're not regenerated. And if they've never been regenerated, and then they continue down that cycle of self-righteousness and pride and trusting in what they're doing, you know, what, whether it's following a particular uh, religion or denomination, uh, plan of salvation, or, or whatever else, then they come... They come in risk of beginning so powerful that the heart begins to harden where they may never receive Jesus alone for salvation mm-hmm. because they've trusted in themselves for too long. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know I've mentioned many times in the past, probably in this series that we're doing together here, I've already said this before, but I, I think this is worth repeating. Uh, we, we see these two terms, uh, believing in Jesus and another one, is believing on Jesus. I believe it really means the same thing, but it gives us different ways of understanding it. Believing in Jesus means you believe in his ability to save you. Believing in Jesus means you believe in his faithfulness to keep the promise to save you. Um, Believing on Jesus means you are depending on him. You're relying on him. You're counting on him. Your confidence is on him or in him. So it, it really, it, it really does mean the same thing, but it's different ways of understanding the same thing. That it's, it's, uh, it's uh, him that's doing the saving, and you're relying on him, not yourself. I want to read this in the Amplified. You know, uh, I've read, we've got almost 30 verses in the study now, and uh, each time I, I read it in the KJV, and I look at the Amplified. And we had one verse in the Amplified where we had a real problem with it because it, it somehow they they inserted uh, the mindset that somehow uh, uh, following and serving Jesus was necessary. Uh, so um, that was a big p- problem. Um, but uh, uh, in, in all the other cases, 
uh, the Amplified Translation has actually been uh, amplified and been very hopeful. Uh, and and I, I think in, in this verse here, it's going to be good. It says, These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, uh, that is, which represents all that Jesus Christ is and does. Uh, so they're saying believing on the, in the name of the Son of God means that you're believing in uh, in uh, all that Jesus Christ is and does. And then they and then the verse says, so that you will know, and they they insert with settled and absolute knowledge that you, and then they insert already have eternal life. So uh, they're. Uh, uh, and the, how they amplified that verse, I think, was, was really very good this time. Anything else before we move on? I think that's great. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next verse now. And this is, uh, let me see, 29 on the list, isn't it right? Is that where we're going next? You yeah, 29. 10, 29. Uh, so that's it, right. it's Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. Okay. Okay. In the KJV, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hmm. Uh, 
I, uh, you know, I have a video asking, uh, what are your favorite books of the Bible? And it's interesting the different choices people put up on that video. And but but my favorite books are uh, Gospel of John, um, because we we learn uh, not only about how to get saved, but the first uh, portion of the first chapter tells us who Jesus is, is the the deity of Christ portion. And then, of course, the book of Galatians, because Paul says, uh, you know, Jesus, Peter, and John, you know, they all said, you get saved by believing on Jesus. But I'm saying, you better not add anything else to it or you ruined it. So that's what Galatians, to me, Paul's contribution is, is saying, don't add anything else or it's ruined. It's, it's no longer of any effect. So it's got to be pure, 100% faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the book of Hebrews. Now, the Hebrews, uh, I, I like that first chapter of Hebrews because that is the greatest chapter in the whole Bible uh, showing us the deity of Christ and who Jesus is. Um, so uh, that's what I'm thinking about when it's talking about here. It says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. Now, in the first chapter, there's goes into much more detail about about this uh, same point here, but here he's, um, it's really showing us that, okay, he, what do you mean, he's a little lower than the angels? Um, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses, you know, they would think that he's uh, actually an angel, but he's the archangel, Michael. Uh, uh, he, he's he's not eternal God Almighty, he's just a God, it's a, a creature, a, you know, the first thing that God created was Michael the Archangel, and that's Jesus. Um, and then uh, in, in the first chapter of Hebrews, that should be completely cleared up. If you read that, you know that uh, that settles it. He's not an angel. Uh, but here he's saying he's a little lower than the angels. How could he be a little lower than the angels? Well, it's because, as he said, uh, he says, um, do, do not think that I came to... Uh, be served, but rather to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So Jesus tells us in that verse there, the purpose of him coming. He said, do not think I came to be served. No, he didn't come so we could all serve and follow Jesus and be his servants and he's our Lord. And, you know, we submit our lives and pick up our cross. He says, no, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And, and so he served. He set an example about, okay, I'll wash everybody's feet as an example for you to be humble and, and want to serve others. If you want to be the greatest, be the least, be the servant. But he's, but the main reason, the main way he served humanity is by, as he said, to give my life as a ransom for many. Now, how could God die? God can't die. God's eternal. So what's he have to do? He has to become a man in order to die. And that's what this verse here, the point is making. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. So he had to be made a human, even less than an angel, just a man, for the purpose of suffering of death. Uh, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So that's why he was made lower than the angel. That's the purpose of him taking on humanity. And that's why the arguments about uh, the in the early church, the first few centuries, and all the church creeds and all the church councils, of the debate about how do you explain the Godhead, uh, so much of their debate, time was spent uh, trying to define it and they did an excellent job in the creeds defining that they absolutely failed when it came to um, soteriology which is you know telling us how to get saved but explaining who Jesus is who the Father is who the Holy Spirit is those creeds are, are great uh, but here is it's saying that uh, uh, he, he had to become a man in order to die and there was a faction in the early church history that were arguing that Jesus couldn't become a man. He, he was, it, it was an illusion. He didn't really have a body. And that's why the creeds point out that, no, he, he had a body. It was, um, 
because he had to really be a man in order to die. Because if he didn't have a body, wasn't a, truly a man, he could not have died for our sins. So this is an integral necessity that he had to become a man. And But there was a faction, I forget what the name of the group was, their philosophy was that anything, the material world is evil. I think it's Gnosticism and or something related to Gnosticism. Uh, but they believe that the material world is evil. So God couldn't take on material flesh because he, that would make him evil. Uh, but this verse here, and the, the, these creeds establish that no, it, you must understand that he did become a man literally, not just figuratively and, you know, like, a vision, uh, like an illusion. Um, well, I haven't even talked about verse 10 yet, but let me, let me just get your thoughts on what I just said there. I forgot to mention, uh, I, it was the, I intended this to be the very first thing I said, <laughs> but I think I listened to you and responded to you and forgot to say what I was intended to say. And the whole point of this series is to um, uh, point out that not only are we saved by believing, but um, if, if any kind of uh, works were required on our part, then it, it must be included in these verses. And every time we see a verse that says believe, and, and there's no mention of repentance uh, of your sins or doing religious works, then uh, that verse has to be either removed from the Bible, discarded, dismissed as non-scriptural, uh, or, or or some something's wrong because it it doesn't tell you everything you need to do. It just simply says, "Believe on the name of the Son of God." It doesn't say anything about working. And this verse here, of course, there's no reference to anybody doing any work. It's referencing the fact that Jesus did the work through His suffering we get salvation. All right, I'll go to the next one unless you want anything else to add. Uh, that's good. Okay. Uh, verse 30, this is uh, I'm, I'm, the 30th reference on the list. Control, let's see. This is um, Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Oh. Do both of these together. Okay, all right, let me see. Yeah, okay, I'll just include 17 there too. Yeah. Okay, let's go 17. All right, so we got 17 included now. So it says, uh, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, uh, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, uh, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There's a lot there. Yeah, we could, we could also add the last verse of chapter 2, for 
him that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to suffer them that are tempted. And yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff there. Again, it just goes back to um, Jesus Christ being God, but then being manifest in the flesh. Um, and that was the means of salvation for mankind um, that he took upon himself, flesh and blood, um, as we are, that through death, through his death on the cross, the blood atonement, that he overcame death for us, um, ultimately through his resurrection three days later. And, you know, since sin came into the world and death by sin, mankind has always been under the curse. It started with the law that was um, spoken by uh, the devil, the serpent, in the Garden of Eden. And since then, there's always been a fear of death. And this is a a bondage that man is in. You know, we know that when we are born, once we come to that time of accountability in, in a person's life, however old they may be, and usually it's very young, where, you know, something happens where they see death, whether it's, you know, um, you know, a relative, a family member, a friend, or um, even, even a pet or an animal. We understand that things die and that we're bondage to that and so we're and we can't do anything about it ourselves but God knew that and found a way for us to overcome come death through him and he took on the seed of Abraham and you know we, we see that really spoken of I think in Galatians 3 um you know, speaking of uh, the seed of promise in Galatians 3.16, and then towards the end of the chapter, I think especially in verse 29, the seed of promise. And that's what we receive. We receive the Word of God, faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We put our trust in God, and then we hear the gospel unto our salvation, and then we believe on the gospel, and the gospel is Jesus Christ. He is the good that he did come in the flesh and die for our sins and overcame death for us through his resurrection and that we have hope now in eternal life through him. He has reconciled us um, and our sins. He's restored that relationship with himself. You know, God, God manifests in the flesh and the person of Jesus Christ and reconcile us to himself through his son. And, and finally in verse 18, and then, uh, you know, the sucker means to aid or assist or to help. You know, he, he's our, um, you know, our redeemer. He delivered us for those who believe on his name. And then we're given the Holy Spirit of promise, which is our comforter, which is our assistant uh, in this world and in a disciple's life. And, you know, the salvation is just a small part of it. You know, once we come to that um, realization uh, that we're a sinner and be a savior and then call upon the name of the Lord, and as we mentioned earlier in this, video that is so important, uh, the name above all names, uh, Jesus Christ, and call upon him as your Savior, um, there we can go on through this thing to become uh, a disciple, and, you know, that's the, that's the majority of a believer's life is as a disciple, you know, uh, the salvation is a moment in time. It's a spiritual rebirth. It's your spiritual birthday. When you are spiritually baptized in Christ, 
once you repent or turn from whatever you're trusting in, whether it's not trusting in anything at all, so tr- turning from unbelief or a false god or a false religion or yourself, um, dead work, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, and turning to God, then that's where repentance in a in the context of salvation, meaning turning away from what you're trusting in and turning in the to God, not turning away from all your sins, because nobody can do that, whether before or after salvation. But simply turning to God, putting your faith in Him, and then being baptized in Christ by the Holy Spirit, all this is a simultaneous event. And so people will get confused about, you know, well, you have to be water baptized. Oh, you have to repent of all your sins and believe. Or there don't understand the spiritual implications of repentance, baptism, and belief or faith. Um, so again, that's a moment in time. But then, you, the Holy Spirit, and mature in the faith, and let Him guide you into doing those things that we need to be doing. You know, we need to get with it once we um, receive eternal life and that spiritual rebirth. But it takes time, and everybody's at a different level, and we should never look at somebody's action to determine whether they are or whether they are not saved. Um, and, uh, you know, that discipleship is a lifelong process as opposed to salvation, when, which is a moment in time. So, again, <laughs> got a long point here. Going, uh, just remind me what Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 2, what it points to. And again, it's the deity of Christ, but then manifesting in the flesh to die for our sins, becoming our sins and our deeper, um, like Boaz is a type of in, in the book of Ruth. Um, and I, I mean, these first two chapters are so incredible and beautiful. And if you don't see the inspiration of God in these verses, I think you're just spiritually blind because um, these first two chapters in, in Hebrews are incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, um, it, it seems like in, in chapter one, uh, it, it, we learn more than any place else about the deity of Christ, that he is truly God. Um, he's not merely a man or a prophet or a miracle worker or a teacher. Or, uh, he's, he's not an angel. He's greater than an angel. And yet then in chapter 2 it says he's less than an angel. And, and, and why? It, it tells us why he had to be a man to be less than an angel. So the idea that um, of this um, duality of, of Jesus, he's fully God and yet he's fully man. Uh, these two chapters teach that and explain why that's necessary. He has to be God because the Bible says only God could be the Savior. He has to be man because only man could suffer and die. die. And he had to suffer and die for our sins. Uh, I'm going to read this portion here in the Amplified. And, uh, let me see. Therefore, since these, his children, share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself, in a similar manner, also shared in the same physical nature, but without sin, so, so that through experiencing death, he might make powerless, that is, ineffective, impotent, him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and that he uh, might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery through, throughout their lives. For, as we all know, he, Christ, does not take hold of the fallen angels to give them a helping hand, but he does take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham, extending to them his hand of deliverance. Therefore, it was essential that he had to be made like his brothers, mankind, in every respect, so that he might experience, he might, by experience, become a merciful and faithful high priest in things related to God to make atonement, that is propitiation, for the people's sins, thereby wiping away the sin 
satisfying divine justice and providing a way of reconciliation between God and mankind. So, um, again, this is uh, the, the subject of this series is uh, faith alone, no works required for salvation. And this is all talking about what Jesus did, what Jesus did. This is all the focus, all the credit is on Jesus. Uh, he was willing to come down from heaven, as he said. Uh, he, he was willing to become a man and suffer and die uh, for, for us. And uh, this, um, so that mankind and God is reconciled and uh, this salvation is available to everyone. Uh, let me see the time we have left. There's time for another one. Uh, uh, yeah, we have like 15 minutes left, so unless you're short on time today. No, we can do it now. Okay. Uh, are you anything else to say to that about that one before I move on, though? No, that was good. Okay, so now we're going to go to Hebrews 5 9. We got a lot of Hebrews verses here, huh? Okay, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Okay, all right, you get to go first on that one. Well, we just saw where Jesus is described as the captain of our salvation, now the author of our salvation and eternal salvation. And that uh, you go back just to the verse before, in verse 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And that's going along the lines of what we just finished reading in Hebrews 2. And then that being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him. So, you know, we are using this verse as evidence of faith alone in Jesus Christ for eternal life. But if we had our, you know, what is it, Superman and Bizarro Superman, you know? So if we were all of a sudden this Lordship Salvation discussion going on, they could use the same verse and twist it into teaching that you had to get back under the works of the law and that you had to have obedient faith. And as we know, that is absolutely false. And I think that a lot of times there's verses that, and I mentioned this before when we were discuss, discussing Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when somebody can look at the hypothetical situation of being in front of, of God at the judgment seat and seeing this person, you know, in verse 22 and 23 saying, look at all the wonderful works I've done, and then teaching that that verse is talking about doing works to go to heaven, how spiritually blind they are. This verse is very similar in the fact that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you look at obey him, just after you read verse 8, that Jesus was in obedience to the Father and that he suffered, that he did all the work. And yet, use that verse in verse 9 when it says obey him and say, oh, now I'm going to use that to say that I'm in obedience and I'm doing things that are pleasing to him for salvation. I'm earning this through my actions. Then you're spiritually blind. You know, he's the author of our salvation, but he's also the finisher of our salvation. If we go just a little bit further, in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, before the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it doesn't say in Hebrews 12, 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author, but we're the finisher of our faith. And it doesn't say looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith in righteousness.
just obedience. It says he's the author and finisher of our faith. So when we get back to this verse, when it discusses about to all of them that obey him, it simply needs to to his authority to understand and recognize that he is who he said he is and rest in his promise, just like the publican did um, in Luke 7 in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee got puffed up. The publican looked down and said, you know, forgive me for I'm a sinner. You know, he submitted to the authority of God that he was eternal life and it was only through him and he received it through faith. That's that's obeying him in this sin. Um, and so, you know, I've had this verse um, used and say, look, you got to have obedience faith. And then, you know, I'm like, well, what's obedience faith? Well, you have to, you know, be a good person and, and persevere to the end. And, you know, you can't lose faith and you can't backslide or fall into sin. You know, we can't keep sinning. Uh, we can't willfully uh, keep sinning at least. And, you know, all these things that aren't in the Bible, but it's man leaning on their own understanding instead of what the Bible said, simply trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Hmm. Yeah, so um, it says, uh, he's talking about the author of eternal salvation. So uh, this is talking about eternal salvation. It's not talking about, you know, being being saved from a plague that comes to your country, something like that. Sometimes the word saved doesn't mean salvation and uh, uh, eternal life. So, but this one clearly is talking about that. And it says uh, uh, that it's for all those, this eternal salvation is for all those that obey Jesus. So it begs the question, what does it mean? To obey Jesus for eternal life. Now you know you know that uh, there's other verses like that. We talked about one verse that says you've got to do the will of the Father, and you've got to follow His commandments, and you've got to obey Him. So what what to get salvation? What is the will of the Father? What are His commandments for salvation? What what are what what is what do you have to obey? How do you have to obey Him in order to get this eternal life, brother? Right. Yeah. Like we talked about yesterday or three days ago, and you know people say, well, you got to do the will of the Father, and then start adding all these works. But the will of the Father, as we saw, was in John six thirty seven through forty, and I can turn to it real fast. But in thirty nine and forty of John six, it says, "And this is the Father's will, which is fit me, that of all which He has given me, I should lose nothing, but." should raise it up again at the last day, and this is the will in this city, that everyone will see the Son and believe it on Him may have the everlasting life, and that will raise Him up at the last day. So, in terms of obtaining eternal salvation and following God's commands or Jesus' commands or obeying Him, is in the sense of putting your faith in Him. You know, we see the same thing um, John makes that same point in 1 John 3, I think. Let's see. I think it's at the end of 1 John 3. Um, Yeah, it says in verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And then verse 23, it says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, to love one another, so he gave us commandment. So what's the commandment there? It's to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of salvation, it's always what he did, not what we do. So never get to 
I see is, you know, obviously I'm talking to whoever's listening here, um, never get confused on what you're doing and making that any way, shape, or form of a part of salvation because it's not. It's strictly what Jesus Christ did for us, and we receive that through faith. Mm -hmm. Anything else that we do after receiving that um, gift, free gift of eternal life, is discipleship. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier being a disciple, maturing and reading the Word of God and developing a prayer life, and maturing in God's grace and mercy, then then not. You're not going to be a good disciple if you don't do those things. Now, you're still saved if you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, but you're just not going to be a very good disciple. And, you know, we talked about that a little bit, you know, looking at the parable of the fellow the other day, and the middle two uh, soils there, you know, which are conditions of the heart that uh, received the seed, received the word of God, but it was on shallow ground, the other one was uh, on thorny ground, um, they didn't persevere. But it wasn't for salvation, as many will teach, and worship salvation, and Calvinism, and Arminianism, and all these other isms that are completely false. But it's that you're not going to continue to produce good fruit. You're not going to produce good fruit because you're not sharing the gospel. That's what it's talking about, and that's what the good soil does in the parable of the sower. Uh, you know, it's, it's a receptive heart that received the word of God, but not only that, but it cultivated the word of God. And the word of God got watered, the seed got watered, and it got sunlight, and it sprouted and grew and continued to grow. And then it, you know, depending on the person and how much time they have in this life, um, their fruit will be 30, 60, 100 fold, you know, and, and that's, that's basically just nickel meat that you're producing, not your good works. Mm -hmm. uh, you did an excellent job. Uh, I, I put you on the spot. Um, you're very good at finding the verses very quickly, uh, much better than I can do that. I can, uh, like, right off the top of my head, I can paraphrase almost any verse. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. I can't necessarily quote it and tell you exactly where it is. So I'm glad to help, you're helping me out here. But uh, I said, what does it mean to obey Jesus or to do the will of the Father or do, do the commandments of Jesus? And you you explain all those things are the same thing, and that is believe on the name of the Son of God for eternal life. That's what you've got to do if you want to please Jesus. Now, Jesus also put some other very uh, strict demands on, on people, too, uh, if they wanted to earn their salvation. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, you better cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, you better pluck it out. Um, if you, uh, even if you have a bad thought, like if you, if you, if you have lustful thoughts, you, it's just as bad as if you actually committed adultery. Um, and he said, go and be perfect. And then he told the rich young ruler, go sell everything you own and give it to the poor and come and follow me. But what's the conclusion of all those things? He's telling people that, look, if you want to earn salvation, the, the bar you have to uh, reach is so high. It's perfection. Go and be perfect. And, and if, that's, if you want to do it without me, you're going to have to be perfect. And that's why his apostles were amazed and they said well lord if that's the case you know he just said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven and they said lord if that's the case how is it possible for anyone to be saved and jesus says with man it is impossible this is the most important thing i want everybody to learn who ever watches any of our videos with man salvation is impossible through our own efforts to our, establishing our own righteousness. It's impossible. But with God, it is possible. With God. And the, the God, the Savior of God is Jesus Christ. 
So if you want to obey Jesus, if you want to do what he commands you to do for salvation, if you want to do the will of the Father for salvation, that all traces right back to the same thing. Uh, you can't do it through your own merit, so you need to put your faith in Jesus. That's what is required. Um, all right, so uh, let me see. I think we're close to an hour now. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, no, we've gone 32 seconds beyond an hour. Uh, okay. All right, brother. It was uh, very interesting. Um, very interesting. Uh, really, I got a lot of, out of, of what you said. And uh, uh, could, you, could you sum up the, your thoughts about the study? Particularly these verses in Hebrews, I think we, we're learning that uh, uh, we need to focus on uh, the work that Jesus did uh, in, in, instead of uh, thinking that uh, um, salvation is determined by any good thing that we do. Reject that and instead uh, put your faith in the good thing that Jesus did on your behalf. He talks about how he became a man and he had to do, become a man in order to suffer and die for you. So thank him for that and have faith in, in him and his, that finished work and uh, rest, rest assured that you're going to go to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. All right, brother, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining me again today and uh, look forward to, to next time. Uh, to the viewers, uh, thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.